Good afternoon and welcome to Muskegon Rotary. My name is Jenny Sprague and I'm privileged to serve as your president for this Rotary year. Our theme for the month of February is Peace and Conflict Prevention and Resolution. Our program today will be presented by the Muskegon County Crisis Intervention Team. And we'll begin as usual with a Pledge of Allegiance followed by a reflection for Ken, by Ken Rath. Rath, excuse me. Okay, we will recite the four-way test at the end of the meeting. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we have our reflection, um, I would like to ask for a moment of silence. We lost one of our fellow Rotarians this week. On Monday, Mort Cantor passed away. Oh, I know, um, a big loss. He's been a member of our Rotary Club for the past 22 years. And I encourage you to read his obituary, which will be in the rim this week, to learn about his many achievements, accomplishments, and all his, his service to our community. So if we could take a moment, please. Thank you all. Ken? Good afternoon. Uh, this is a, a three-part um, reflection today. It's a reflect, a pray, and an act. And this comes from a website called Franciscan Media. The reflect. Many of the things that affect us are out of our control. Today, let's pray for radical acceptance to live in the grace of God unattached to specific outcomes to pray creator of heaven and earth nothing that happens escapes your knowledge you know what makes us anxious you know what fills us with fear and dread you know to the desires of our heart you know that we long what we long for and what we work for you know the outcomes for which we hope today we rest in the truth that you knowingly that, that you knowing us is enough I cannot, I, we cannot control much, but we can choose to believe you will be with us come what may. So today we pray for the ability to radically accept that which we, that which we are accept, we are asked to accept, knowing we, we are never alone and we are always loved. Amen. In the act part, sit still for a moment with your palms turned upwards in a gesture of freedom. Take three deep breaths slowly inhaling and exhaling and say this prayer jesus i trust you thank you thank you you may be seated to enjoy your lunch we'll resume the meeting at 12 20. and there's a prize for anybody that can identify what the new music uh, was it's not fanfare for the common man anymore anybody know what Mike chose I know my husband would get this one it's victory at sea it was a biggie back in the 50s and 60s so, so anyway moving on I am going to um, you know normally I share a foundation moment with you I don't need that um, but today, in honor of Leap Day, it is February 29th, happens every four years. Uh, we are going to uh, just look at that a little bit. So it's Leap Day. That means we're going to talk about leap, jump, calendars, and cartoons. Leap. According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it, is an, it can be used as an intransitive verb, like leap over a fence, a fish leaps out of the water, a transitive verb, leaped the wall, or a noun, a great leap forward. So that's your English lesson for the day. Um, Superman, he can leap tall buildings with a single bound. Remember that. Kids play leapfrog.
Here you go. Indiana Jones took a leap of faith in um, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. <laughs> Kids like to jump rope. Mark Twain wrote The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County. And the small text there says, it certainly had a wide celebrity, but I was aware that it was only the frog that was celebrated. It wasn't I. <laughs> we can jump to conclusions. The caption to the cartoon says, that's the skip forward button. Great for jumping to conclusions. But today is the actual leap day. And what does that mean? Well, we have to thank this guy for starting the whole thing. Julius Caesar and the Julian calendar. You know, you see down there at the bottom, he looks a little grumpy. And I think that has to do with the fact that this involved a lot of math. And remember, he was using Roman numerals, so that had to be a real pain. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he, uh, in 46 BC, replaced the lunar calendar with his calendar, the Julian calendar, to account for um, the days getting out of whack with the, the, the moon and then went to a different way. And that stayed in effect till, uh, what's it, I can't remember when the Julian calendar, I mean, the, um, the Gregorian calendar came in in 1582, still involving math. Um, but when it comes down to it, the big thing about leap year, every four years, it lands in this month, which is already an annoying month. And it means an extra day of politics. Because <laughs> it's always an election year. So. Okay, your lesson for the day is concluded. Um, I invite Chris to come forward to introduce our program for the day. Oh wait, sorry, I forgot. I should have turned my page. Hold that thought, Chris. It is time for guests. See, I leapt to a conclusion, didn't work. All right. Um, hi, I'm Chris Colley. This is my fiance from the French region of fiancés. Um, <laughs> you'll find out. Um, this is Mark Vanderself, and he is chief of Norton Shores Police Department. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Alex Fonseca, and today I have Steve Glasscock with me. Um, he is with Consumers Credit Union. He's the um, manager for the Norton Shores. Well, will be Norton Shores. Yep. So, Grand Haven, Muskegon, soon to be Norton Shores in Roseau Park. Um, and Steve's married with two children that go to Mona Shores. And you've been a Rotarian before at White Lake, right? Yep. Yep. So, he's looking at possibly joining Muskegon. This is my friend, Julie Dawes. We used to work at the hospital together on the ortho floor. She's retired now, widowed, and lives over in Sherman Manor area. And she's just looking for something new to do. All right, you know where to go. So Good afternoon, Rotary. I was so upset you almost skipped the guest. I Anyways, please join me in welcoming our guests from Oak Ridge. <laughs> to introduce, introduce two of the seniors is Carla Cavern. She is a psychologist at the school. Perfect. So we have two seniors here. We have Kara. Did I say that right? Yes. In the Carly. That really confused me when Kara asked me to come because I'm Carla, right? So 
that's confusing. Um, but they really represent a lot of what is going on at Oak Ridge with sports and our, our MTSS academics and all of the things that they're doing. So I'm going to hand it over to them. My name is Kara Morris. Um, I'm a senior at Oak Ridge. I participate in cross country basketball and soccer and I'm part of NHS. And I plan to go to MCC next year to major in finance and use the Muskegon Promise. <laughs> Um, my name is Carly Morse, and I am a senior at Oak Ridge. I participate in golf, basketball, softball, and the drama program, and I am also in NHS. I also am planning to go to MCC using the Muskegon Promise and major in psychology. Wait for that. There we go. Now, welcome to all our guests. And um, I was so eager for the program that I jumped ahead. Sorry, <laughs> leap ahead. Chris, please come up and get us started. <laughs> mm -hmm. Come on up and join me, Chad and team. It's definitely fitting to have this topic today on a conflict resolution month for International Rotary. Um, some of you um, were part of the presentation that was conducted over the pandemic over Zoom when CIT first got started. So there, a lot has changed since then, and we thought it'd be great to bring in a panel of individuals to talk about the great work which is going on with the crisis intervention team. So first of all, we're going to have um, individuals, they're going to um, also introduce themselves as we go along. So. Heather, we're going to start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm Heather Wiegand, and I serve as a clinical manager at HealthWest. I'm a licensed professional counselor and born and bred in Muskegon County. And um, if you know me, or if you're in the audience and you know me, you already know I'm a troublemaker, but usually for all the right reasons. Um, and if you don't know me, we probably should talk before I leave. That way I can give you some warning before I get there. You get the heads up. Tell us, what is the Muskegon County Diversion Council? Okay. The Diversion Council is currently more than 30 members strong in terms of organizations and teams. We started out back in 2014 in my early days at Community Mental Health, um, where I went to my supervisor at the time and said, hey, I heard that you guys used to have this jail diversion committee, and I'd like to resurrect that. And so we started out in this little room at HealthWest with uh, probably three of us from HealthWest and then two people from the sheriff's office. That was our committee. Um, and the purpose of that was really to try to do good work to divert people away from incarceration who needed care and treatment. Um, so we've fast forward all this time later and we, we quickly grew out of the jail diversion committee. Um, John Gale, who used to serve as the chief of police at Norton Shores, really came involved when he got appointed to the Diversion Council at the state level. Uh, we educated John on what was diversion, because he didn't know at the time, and then he helped us learn what could we do to partner more strongly with law enforcement and do things pre-jail versus just once someone ended up in jail. So here we are all these years later, and we have a very robust Diversion Council that meets weekly in some form or another, lots of committees and activities, lots of partnerships across every intercept of community level resources, law enforcement, and throughout our, our, our judicial system. Yeah, so that is a lot of information, right? But the biggest thing is the partnership that was created in 2014 to really divert people from going to jail, because we know that not everybody belongs in jail, right? Yes. So then that next step was CIT. Bruce, tell us about who you are, what you do, and what is CIT. All right, my name is Bruce Morningstar. I work for Norton Shores Police Department as a police officer. And my current role there is a crisis response specialist. So I respond, I do a, a co-response along with a mental health professional uh, on crisis type calls in the community. And the CIT that you're talking about um, for is the crisis inter intervention team. And that consists of a multi faceted, uh, multi, uh, I guess, multi-disciplinary um, 
uh, team that, that handles all kinds of crisis calls throughout the community from the, the time they start until the time we uh, put the right resources in place to help people uh, through those, those crisis calls. So really, what, what was the old system? What was happening? What was not working that makes CIT different? I would say that, that the old way of doing things was kind of 911, what's your emergency? And, and um, they would decide whether it was a police officer, a firefighter, or an ambulance that needed to respond to that call. And that wasn't, none of those were the right resource in a lot of the calls that were coming in. And so um, basically trying to find some, some partnerships and uh, getting the right resource to the right place. And so the, the old way of doing things was kind of, um, by default, law enforcement responded to a lot of these calls. And we were kind of putting a Band-Aid on it when really what was needed was st stitches or surgery of some sort. You know, it was more complex than just a law enforcement call. And, um, you know, us just going out there and calming things down and then moving on to the next call. And a lot of times going back to that same call over and over again. So not a real great use of resources when we're using the wrong resources. Absolutely. And Chad, that kind of bleeds into who is involved in this, right? So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you're involved, and then who else is at the table? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Chad Lawton. I'm the EMS administrator here in Muskegon County. So I work with a, uh, a medical director, emergency department physician to oversee uh, EMS here in Muskegon County. We oversee 17 life support agencies. So all of our fire departments who respond on medicals with us and two ambulance agencies. So, and I'm originally from Ludington, but I've been here in uh, the Muskegon area for about 15 years now. So, um, so lots of partners. Number one, you know, we have 11 law enforcement agencies here locally in Muskegon County that participate with us, uh, 15 fire departments, two ambulance agencies, Trinity Health EMS, um, Trinity Health, uh, Muskegon Hospital, uh, Muskegon Central Dispatch, but it's not just public safety either. It's much broader than that. So um, other partners such as the, the, the rescue mission, um, age well, um, every woman's place. There's several partners and it, it, it extends farther than that, even all the way down to the individual community members partnering with us as well. So, you know, we, we think back to um, innovative models, right? And what's different? What is evidence-based, right? And CIT is definitely one of those programs that you've seen in other communities. And that's how it came here, right? Is that replication of, how, we could do that because you got, you make good trouble, right? But we've also seen over the pandemic a lot of things, right? Black Lives Matter. We've seen a call for changing of policing um, and that 21st century policing, but also the importance that mental health has played in our lives, especially since the pandemic. So Heather, kind of bring that home. Like, what does that mean for CIT? Why is it different in that way? So CIT and here in Muskegon, we've elected to utilize the CIT international model as our go-to model of efficacy. And we have a little ways to go before we can claim stake to that completely. But the truth is, what is CIT? It is essentially doing the work to advance your crisis response system in your community all the way through. And so traditionally we think about that as Chad just expressed that 911 call, EMS, fire, police shows up. And even today, some people are very familiar with co-response by a mental health worker or a mobile crisis team. But it's even bigger than that. It's like if, if there's a single person in this room who has not experienced a crisis in your life, I would love to talk to you afterwards to know your secret. Um, because that's the bottom line is crisis happens everywhere. It happens at church, it happens at school, it happens at your home, in your neighborhood. And the point is there's not a single person in our community that's not responsible to some level of being a part of our crisis response team, our crisis intervention team. It, your level is gonna be different depending on your lens and where you're coming from. Um, and as Chad was saying before we got up here, this is so complex. In the 20 minutes we have today, it will be very difficult to send you out with an expertise, but we certainly hope that we send you out with a hunger for more knowledge about how you can be involved. That's the whole point is we have to learn how to work together. If we keep doing things the way we've always done them, we have no choice but to expect the same outcomes. Um, and I don't know about you, but I want to see different outcomes. I want to leave a, a safer Muskegon for my kids and grandkids. 
So this is really about systemic change. This is definitely macro level, like social work at its finest, right? It's really looking at how the systems all interact with one another and then what kind of gaps and issues does it create, right? So we've experienced some success in a few different ways, right, Bruce? What are some of those impacts that you can think of? I would say that some of the biggest impacts that we've had um, come from not just trying to solve a community problem with one resource and not having a, a siloed issue where um, we're kind of pointing at each other going, hey, why didn't you fix this yet? And so, um, you know, working together, you know, and getting, I, I can't think of a better group than a group like this that understands that partnership of partnership and collaboration um, to, to help understand what, what we've achieved uh, with these partnerships. Um, it really does come down to uh, looking at things through different lenses and trying to come up with ways to solve problems, like really solve them, not just put the Band-Aid on and, and drive away. You know? So um, I would say that that's one of our biggest successes, those partnerships. Yeah, and so one of the very first things that you all started were the quarterly trainings. Tell us about the quarterly trainings. Who's attended those trainings? So we've trained, Again, a multidisciplinary audience. Um, it started out kind of a lot of law enforcement going through the training, but then um, realized that you know it's not just about training law enforcement. It's about having a lot of voices from different entities in that room and training them together to to uh, have them work together. Um, you know, if you train one part of a large system, that doesn't help fix the system, so to speak. And so um, we've probably trained. I'm going to guess probably 200 um, people in our multidisciplinary multidisciplinary team so. and it's 40 hours of training that they go through right and it's a, a variety of topics like age well we go in and we talk about what's happening with the geriatric population and really how to um, interact with individuals that may be experiencing dementia delusion or depression because that's something that we often see and we get calls police departments and so do health west about what's going on with her she's seeing bugs on the wall and that's not normal. Well, what they don't know is she's probably got a UTI and UTI presents differently. So having an interfacing with those types of specific types of crises seems to have been really helpful for officers and others to really open up their understanding to that. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it's cool stuff, right? Um, and Heather, let's talk about policy, because <laughs> that's always the fun part in systemic change, right? Is sometimes it really has to be at that larger level of advocacy, right? Yeah, I mean, this is where the fun begins, right? right. This is where I really get to cause trouble. Get yeah. it. Um, and this is me showing up to your, wherever you work, saying, I would love to read your policies um, because I'm going to come back and ask you to change them. Yes. Um, and so we're really digging in to figure out, because there's this reality too, though, that there are systems with non-negotiables, right? We have police officers who work in a system where there are some non-negotiables. We have fire departments and EMS, and there are actual laws out there. Not that I'm opposed to trying to change laws, because I am not opposed to that. Um, if it doesn't make sense, it should be changed. But how do we go about that? And so for us, we're looking at that local level, agency partnership level. How can we do the works to build cohesive policies and procedures that lay out how we're each going to respond to that call? What's our responsibility to it? Can we do that? Who's in our way? Do we have a board? Do we have attorneys we need to consult with? Let's get them all involved. To get bigger than that, is there local policy or rule, county level, legislative level? Is it state? Is it federal? First, we have to learn where the issue is, and then we figure out how can we come at it in a temporary solution? How can we be creative and do our best work to support each other to the best of our ability? Always remembering none of us are always going to have all the answers, and no matter what, there's resources missing. We know that every system represented up here is broken in some way, shape, or form. We have a lot of work to do. But as long as we keep coming to the table willing to have conversations, there's absolutely no reason why we can't figure it out together. And we know that when trust is built through consistency and relationships, then that can only foster good work. Yes. as it continues. So let's talk about a couple of tangibles here. First of all, let's just talk really briefly about the mobile response team at Health West and what they do. 
So mobile response at HealthWest actually started several years ago, and we started this process first with youth services, and we were out there with staff who worked their 40 hour a week job, and then were volunteering for shifts uh, to work after hours. And then we quickly moved into creating an adult response team too, similarly. And we've had some evolution, uh, growing pains, I will say, because again, this really evolved initially out of full time staff, including myself, serving after the end of my workday for the overnight shift to go out in our community and respond to crisis. I will tell you in those early days, I remember one month serving like almost 20 shifts in a month. That was a lot on top of my full time job, and so we you can understand that we quickly had staff who didn't want to do that. <laughs> um, and so then we had to move to a mandatory calendar to put people they had no choice um, now that did reduce the number of shifts people did right, but here we are today all this time later, and we now at HealthWest have a staff of 30 plus that serve as our warm line call takers and mobile response team generally through the day. We still do have that second layer of on-call staff who are full-time employees, but they're volunteering for those shifts. Um, and now we're covering 24 seven, the majority of the week. Um, we're super close to literally being 24 seven, 365 days a year knowing that when you call our helpline at 722-4357 it's a health west person picking up that call and talking with you and typically resolving the call there at that level uh, but at any point at any time we are deploying a team of two into our community to do crisis response and resolving any situation we can where they are without having to take them to a hospital which is so important because we're normally siloed right and what happens over there doesn't necessarily happen over here i've got different rules i'll never forget when you guys started deploying um people for 24-hour care and it was like oh my gosh there are so many people it's happening so often and you think that you open pandora's box right because sometimes you never know what you're getting yourself into and then when you start doing it it's like incredible the volume that you've had in response so we know that systems can be really overburdened too and underfunded which is <laughs> hello look at all of us right <laughs> every single one of our silos are that way chad talk to us a little bit about um the behavioral alternative response yeah so uh, you know heather speaking about overcoming uh policies and, and and such i remember her coming to me several years ago and telling me Hey, uh, we want to start diverting some of your patients away from the ED. We, we, we want you to turn them over to us on scene so we can follow up with them and, and uh, provide them care. And I was like, well, that's, that's illegal. So that's not, <laughs> so that's not going to happen. So, Can't do that. <laughs> uh, I said you have to start coming to every meeting. Yeah, and talk about meetings too. Holy smokes. <laughs> um, so fast forward to today. And, we were able to overcome a lot of that by uh, getting creative with the statute and, and um, changing our policies, like Heather mentioned. Uh, we're the first ones in the state of Michigan to adopt a protocol for this specifically. And I apologize for the name, I'm quite a literal person. So behavioral health alternative response is what it's called. It's exactly what it sounds like. Instead of sending an ambulance, we're gonna send an alternative response and that's gonna be the mobile crisis team. So what we found um, when she was pulling me into this conversation early on was that they're seeing a lot of the same population of patients that we're seeing um, and they're probably better equipped to, to deal with these folks than we are um, you know mind you uh, ems started back in the early, you know late 60s early 70s based off a white paper from nitsa um, primarily focused on accidental death and disability on the highway it wasn't really geared or or uh, you know there wasn't forethought there to be dealing with um, a lot of psych, psych problems and behavioral health problems that we are seeing so um, so ems has never really been the best fit in this world in in my opinion and likewise neither is the emergency department and a lot of times these folks are going to the emergency department and uh you know being stabilized very rapidly and uh right back out the door sometimes within you know um an hour or two or, or less so and what we find from law enforcement and EMS side is that we're then, you know, kind of rerunning this same call on this same person over and over, and we're never really solving the problem definitively. And so this was uh, um, an opportunity uh, that we were already kind of looking at 
the biggest question was trying to come over those hurdles as far as uh, legalities from a med legal standpoint and we were able to do that and we started the program um, collaborating with them a little over a month ago i think we've ran a little over 40 calls yep. so far in the last 50. month almost 50 and it's been pretty successful so far so um, and again, our thing is about getting the right resource to the right patient at the right time. And, and really, we feel that they are better suited for this subpopulation of patients that we're talking about. Thank you. Cue the video. It's got a little video for you. <laughs> Police departments across Muskegon County are embracing a new strategy to let mental health workers diffuse situations involving those going through a crisis. Three clinicians from the county's behavioral health provider are trained to de-escalate situations and connect people with lasting care. News 8's Byron Tollefson in Norton Shores with more on how it works. The trained mental health clinicians now work inside Muskegon, Muskegon Heights, and Norton Shores Police Departments. They go out and work alongside officers, helping those in a behavioral health crisis. De-escalating situations and connecting those in a crisis with lasting care. That's the job description for three Health West employees in their new workplace, now right inside police departments across Muskegon County. This is just an innovative and without a doubt necessary tool in our community to impact effectively persons experiencing crisis. Carrie Freddy is one of the three mental health clinicians. Every day during the week, she rides along with Norton Shores police officers. She's right there as police respond to 911 calls of somebody in crisis. If it's safe to do so, she often goes into the residence first to try to talk the person down. Individuals within our community are more apt to speak to her sometimes than somebody in a uniform. She responds to domestic violence situations, wellness checks, substance abuse problems, mental illness, and more. Law enforcement we're the first ones that are being called there, but we don't necessarily have all the tools or have the, the schooling or the education on how to handle those properly. So having somebody that has that education, has that knowledge of all the other resources that we can provide to our citizens, it's instrumental. HealthWest Clinical Manager Heather Wiegand explains that workers focus on QPR, question, persuade, refer. It's suicide prevention training with workers recognizing the warning signs and finding out quickly if the person needs to go to the emergency room or receive a psychiatric intervention. We're looking for those individuals to have knowledge about how to really pick up on the signs and symptoms. Does this person in front of me require treatment, right? They have that solid knowledge. After it's all over, clinicians often go back to the home and connect the resident with long-term care. The Norton Shores Police Chief says they also support officers' mental health. While they're riding along with, with Carrie, they're actually also getting some um, personal care, too. And that's very important to me as a big picture that our officers are provided some mental health care from the situ situations that they see on a daily basis. A grant is supporting all three workers' positions through September of next year. Wiegand wants them to be permanent and plans to ask cities to guarantee the positions through its budget each year. In Norton Shores, Byron Tollefson, News 8. Isn't that awesome? It's incredible. The work that's been done. I'm getting all emotional because I'm looking at you getting emotional, um, but this work is really important. Um, so we're ready for Q&A, but I'm going to ask the first question, okay, while Jackie gets the microphone going. The question is, we have a big barrier that needs to be addressed. Tell us about that, Heather. Big barrier. Oh, my gosh. There's lots of those. Um, I'm not sure which one you're alluding to. Oh, okay. So... <laughs> I mean, we could be here a long time. Right. Um, Let's just be quiet. So one of the, one of the things I hope for is that Chris will invite us back here in a year or, you know, in the future. And up here with us will be a representative from Trinity's emergency room to help share with you that we've made headway in providing some training to emergency room personnel, and that we are working together cohesively to understand that. Um, when someone does make it to the emergency room, there's, there's a need for a partnership at that level also, right? And to make sure that they are equipped to understand the complexities of the people who are showing up, especially those repeat visitors, the ones that don't know how to utilize the system. You know, we're trying to educate our community that when you have a routine need, call 211. It's a beautiful service that has all kinds of knowledge. When you have an urgent need, call 722-HELP, 
we have resources at community mental health that will come right to you and help you navigate your crisis when you have a life-threatening emergency this is when we want you calling 911 right and so bringing our emergency room into that fold and they very much are at the table so their absence today does not mean they're not a partner they absolutely are a partner and are very heavily involved more today than even a month ago um, they they want to be at the table and help us to create solutions but let's face it our emergency room was not created for this population and so what we're headed towards is really looking at building a crisis stabilization unit in Muskegon County, which would be an alternative to our emergency room, a facility that is equipped and intentional for behavioral health crisis. That's, that's what we want to see happen here. Over here. Uh, first, thank you for the presentation, but even more importantly, thank you for what you do every day. Uh, you mentioned a 40 hour uh, training program how could an organization or an individual uh, subscribe to that? That was not an easy lift, I'll tell you. When I first went to law enforcement and said, I need you to give up police officers for 40 hours uh, for training, they were like, no, we can't do that. And I'm like, yes, yes, you can. Um, and so we did, one of the incentives that we did was we wrote a grant and found some funding through the Bureau of Justice Administration to help us reimburse officers for coming to that training. So we contributed to the police department's budget to be able to backfill uh, and put on the road somebody with overtime um, so that individuals could come to the training. Now that was the seed money, right? We're not, we're no longer paying for them to come to our trainings. now. Now, uh, officers and departments understand the value of this and, and how important it is, and they've figured it out to make sure that they can come. Um, 40 hours is a lot, and I'll, I'll tell you, it's not just an investment on the participant side. It's a heavy lift on the other side. We, have the, the, we did a study on how much goes into creating this 40-hour training, and the biggest training we ever did took 129 people to pull off. That was all the behind the scenes work of scheduling, organizing, setting up. That was every facilitator that came in. That was the professional coaches that came in. We have actors that come in, people with lived experience who come in to do scenario-based training. This is no easy lift, and this is a community effort. Every agency that Chad mentioned earlier has a role in that, and there's many, many more organizations in this community who have stepped up, show up, provide facilitation, provide coaching. I mean, it's just amazing to watch what happens. So I think what he's asking is, is there an opportunity for agencies to have people go through that? Training? Well, we could, yes. Um, we're not gonna fill the room, right? Because the point is to educate people who are doing crisis response. So if you're in a role to do crisis response, there's a seat for you, 100%. If you're a person in our community that has interest in sitting through the training so you better understand and have an investment, I will reserve a seat for you also, but those those are going to be less of those during each training. Thank you very much for what you're doing. How or who makes the call that a situation is safe enough for a non uniformed person to enter. So police are always there. <laughs> Police officers are always there. Yeah, so there's kind of there's kind of two um, avenues to the mobile crisis response team. One is if uh, an individual in the community calls directly to Health West. Well, actually, I guess there's three. Let me step back on that okay. for a second. There's three. So what I just said is number one. Uh, number two would be if law enforcement responds on a call uh, where EMS is not involved. Um, pick your reason for that domestic violence, I guess, um, is an example. Uh, and they get there and they determine that uh, they could benefit from the team. Uh, they can make a referral directly to the Healthwest team. And then the third avenue would be um, if somebody calls in through 911 uh, and there's a medical component to it, including a behavioral health issue, um, it would go through a call taking triaging process. Uh, and then it would be captured during that and then referred over uh, to, their, to their line. Did that, did that answer the So question? it will go from 911 central dispatch transition to the EMS dispatch and they would deploy the mobile crisis team to that scene. Right. So in, in all of those scenarios, well, 
in two of those scenarios, law enforcement's going to be on those scenes. So if it's going through 911, it, law enforcement's responding to 100% of those calls. Um, if it's coming directly into uh, Health West, uh, maybe you can talk to how you guys yeah. would determine whether or not you need law enforcement response with you. And so we're going to go to the scene, uh, but if we know circumstances about that before we get there or we show up and there's any hesitation at all, then our team is absolutely educated and trained to reach out to 911 and we will stage at the situation until they get there to make sure everyone involved stay safe. I love this program. I'm a public defender in our county and all of my clients potentially can go to prison, but so many of them see health professionals like you during that process. I wasn't aware of the deferment program, but I guess my question is, if a call hasn't been made and they've been charged, or um, maybe this particular call didn't have a health professional there, so many of our clients actually go see Health West and you know the list is long well before their trial or a plea and substance abuse ultimately is their is their sentence is there a way we can get to you have you spoken to dj maybe about maybe how we can cancel a charge and then they connect with the right professional for them to be placed in the right position because they maybe missed that window of that call or that connection with you before they met me yes absolutely 100 percent one of the ingredients we have in our community that's evolved over the last five years is what we call the CIT referral. This is a document, it's a web-based document that any professional partner in our community, including the public defender's office, our prosecutor's office, law enforcement, it's web-based. Anyone with Wi-Fi fills that out, submits it, and it comes to a team at HealthWest. That includes people who are booked into our jail. There's specifically a workflow that happens if it's a CIT referral coming from a community partner it's going to be forwarded to our jail based team. If the person's already in jail corrections officers public defenders anyone in the judicial system can use that form and we're going to have a person in front of them same day next day to understand is is there a need for treatment for this person and should we do the work to divert them out of jail in a post booking process and still connect them to the right doors of care so if you want more information about that referral form specifically i'm happy to share it with you okay last question just a question and it's probably due to my own ignorance so i'll put that out there uh having been a nursing professional with a psychiatric background i'm just curious how much you reach out to other than uh, social workers to provide these services so right now, the mobile crisis response team is pretty much behavioral health professionals, and those are at a variety of levels. Those could be master level clinicians, or those could be bachelor level professionals that have been trained, or even peer supports, people who have lived experience. Um, if you're volunteering, we'd be happy to talk to you uh, with that experience. Um, and if we have nurses or paramedics or EMTs out there who would like to pick up some extra hours by being trained to be mobile response, we will never turn them away. We would love to see that, yes. Well, thank you very much for a very informative program. We appreciate the job. As a, just a, for your um, interest here, as a thank you to you for presenting to us today, uh, Muskegon Rotary will be making a contribution to Hand Wash, which is a cooperative initiative between Terra Nueve and Haiti and Champion Rotary District 6290 to provide clean water, sanitation, and hygiene in rural areas of Haiti. So your crisis innovation, intervention goes even farther than you knew. We are moving on to birthdays. And look at this, we have a Esther Rico. She is one of those people that only has to acknowledge her age every four years. So happy birthday to <laughs> Esther. Steve Olson, March 1st. Kevin Rico, March 2nd. Blake Kramer, March 4th. And Monica Turnbull on March 5th. Happy birthday to all of those. Uh, Rotarians, and we hope that they will make their $10 gift to support the Caring Connection. Our next item is our spotlight video. 
This week's on, um, presenter is Rabbi Alan Alpert. Uh, my name is Alan Alpert, and I've been in Rotary for, I believe, over 40 years. I have been more quiet because of my work, and I am the only rabbi in Muskegon, so I've helped out with the bulletin at one time and a number of things, but I do, I do my best, and I try to listen and learn from the programs and the people in Rotary. I think that it's, I'm going back, and even before Jesus, there was a Hillel, and he said, do not, do not unto others what is odious to you. That is the Torah, the rest is commentary, go and learn. And so that it's, it's in terms of we may not agree with everything, yeah, that's not quite as important. The, the, what is more important is dialogue. It's also that in the in something called the Perkei Avot, which is in the Mishnah and rabbinic literature, it said, be of the disciples of Aaron, seeking peace and pursuing it. And I think that's true of not every Jew, but for Jews generally. Peace is, is not just a lack of, of um, hostility, but uh, peace is basically the word shalom means completeness. And that is something that we should all try to see everyone in the image of God. And I, I would hope and I think that those around me that have taught me that whether whatever the religion, see the positive, see the divinity in everyone, if we saw that, then we would not hurt each other. Thank you to Rabbi Alpert and actually all of you that have done these uh, videos for us. We learn a lot from you, so we really appreciate you saying yes when we ask you to do one. We have no induct inductions today, and there are no Paul Harris Fellow Awards, so we're moving on to announcements. So Jason, Emma, and Christine, if you can come up and be over here and be ready, I just have a few to share with you before they do. Uh, next week, we are back at the Delta. See, we've got to make sure we're paying attention. Where are we going? So next week, go back to the Delta. Rewind does not meet this evening. I'd like to share a brief thank you note that um, Kathy Brubaker Clark received uh, from uh, Jan, who was with Braver Angels. Uh, she says, hello, Kathy. It was so rewarding to see everyone at the workshop. The participation and commitment of your organization is such a bright moment. I know the community is so fortunate to have such a wonderful group of Rotarians working together. I enjoyed seeing familiar welcoming faces. Let's connect later in the year to talk about plans for next year. Thank you for your great support and taking care of so many details. It's a big job that makes a big difference in the success of the day. All the best, Jan. So thank you so much to Kathy and her group uh, with the Peace Builders Club. We did have an interesting discussion, so we greatly appreciate their efforts on that. Uh, tonight, there is a new member social event. It's at the Heritage Museum of Business Indust and Industry on Western from 5 to 7. And today is the last day to purchase district raffle tickets. If you are interested, the tickets are $20 each. Meredith Smiley will be happy to take your money from you and give you a ticket, and you could be a big winner. You never know. And so please see her uh, for that. Uh, now we are going to individual member announcements Emma and Jason are going to take it off. Take it away first. There we go. Not take it off. That sounded bad. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. <laughs> okay. You, you go first. Okay. Jay <laughs> Okay. Okay. Get okay. Okay. Jason and I are up here as part of the Pores for Community Committee. Um, this year is the third year that we've done this event, so we've slowly been working on figuring things out and growing it. And we're really excited about this year's event. There's a couple flyers on every table. I know Tim Arter mentioned it, I think, last week or the week before, but we just want to call attention to the flyer. 
Um, we've finalized dates, locations, new this year is a trivia night at Valkyrie. Um, but also we need sponsors to help us make this a successful event. And so you'll see um, different recognition levels. And also there's a form if you wanna fill it out, you can fill it out, give it back to Tim Arter. There's a QR code if you just wanna make a gift to support it. But primarily, I think we really want people to come and to bring their friends. Um, this is just a social opportunity outside of our lunch meetings. Um, and to, to, to build um, within the community knowledge about Rotary. So that's all I really have. Yeah. So if you're looking for an opportunity for fellowship or to bring your company out for an outing, you can try a, uh, a night of trivia at Valkyrie, special drink at Wonderland. Uh, they have this beer called Revel Rouser at Unruly. If you wanna give that a shot or new this year, I brought a prop to show everyone. Anyone's familiar with a Wheeze in the Juice from Grand Armory, we are doing our special own private label of Wheeze in the Juice that will exclusively be available at 794 Kitchen and Grill. And we are holding a special uh, naming and uh, there may be a little tasting today to find out the name of that beverage. But we'd love to see you out, bring your friends, bring your company and share a night of fellowship. And let us know if you'd like to sponsor. Thank you. He's, he's very tall. All right. So I'm up here, an, an unusual um, advocate for um, the Michigan Reed, the great Michigan Reed. Um, about a month ago, Sarah and Madel, Ron brought these books and um, announced that the DEI committee and I think Madel are partnering and I, I could be making this stuff up. Um, I was just there, saw this very colorful book. And I said, you know, I'm going to be taking a trip. I'm going to be on an airplane in an airport. And I'm going to have some time on my hands because I don't usually read fiction. And so I picked it up and I couldn't put it down. And it is a phenomenal book. Um, it's a it's a Michigan author. I think it's her first book. Um, but I wanted to share um, a little bit about it. Um, so it's and I could be messing up her name, but it's Angeline Bouye. It's her date. Yeah, her debut novel, Firekeeper's Daughter, is captivating, powerful story that explores complex themes such as identity family community and justice the novel follows a journey of an 18 year old girl who is a biracial tribal member so she's part uh Ojibwe and and part french um she navigates challenges of her dual identity the trauma of losing loved ones and pressures of being a bridge between two cultures but it's just um I just share another highlight um Yet, e this is a quote from the book or a part of the book. Yet, even with such deep roots, I don't always feel like I belong. Each time my Fontaine grandparents or their friends have seen my Ojibwe side as a flaw or a burden to overcome, and the less frequent but more heart breaking instances when my firekeeper family sees me as a Fontaine first and one of them second. So throughout this book, it's it's a Nancy Drew type mystery. Um, lots of, you know, with Women's History Month coming next month, lots of um, challenges that women face, but then from a tribal approach on the overlayering of issues with working with tribal uh, legal apparatus as well as local or federal legal apparatus. So it's a very good book. Um, when you get to the end, you'll be surprised by the ending, um, but just a marvelous story. So I hope, um, and Sarah will know the date because I didn't write good notes last night, but next month, or no, April, she's coming, April 17th. Um, the, the author is coming to our club to present. It will be a much better presentation if you've read the book. So I have two more copies that the club has. It's available on audio, it's available at the libraries, it's probably available at the bookstore. Where else, Sarah, go ahead. Oh. Okay, all right, so. Okay, our club program about the book is March 28th. 
and then she's coming the following month. See, they probably sent the wrong ambassador, but hopefully my job was to get you excited to read the book. So there are um, information about the book. If you want to learn about this, the um, Ojibwe tribe, again, the Ojibwe tribe, she's, this book is written in Sugar Island. Those of you who know Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and Ontario, um, that's the location. Um, it's just a wonderful story. So come read the book. Did I meet you? You did fine. <laughs> so. um, the um, this pamphlet that Christine has is a reader's guide to the book, and she does have some of those as well. So we would appreciate your participation. We are ready for the raffle. So Mary Beth, which way are we going first? Okay, five dollars. Four hundred. Look at your tickets. Last three digits. Four zero zero. Oh, we have a winner. John Noling, congratulations. So I take it we're going for ten next because she wanted to be orderly. Four, four, six. Going once, going twice. I'd say draw again. Three, four, two. Three, four, two. Oh, we have a winner. Yay. <laughs> See, it helps to come to Rotary, you get 10 bucks. <laughs> well, that was generous. Okay, so for our $20 winner, 367. Oh, Marina, congratulations. <laughs> So yeah, somebody said keep drawing until we get somebody that takes it, but, but we won't. <laughs> so next week's program will be presented by the Grand Valley State University Annis Water Resources Institute. Remember, we will be back at the Delta, and if you'll rise, we'll recite the four-way test. Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Go out, have a good week, create some hope in the world, and we are adjourned. <laughs>